bringing out some of the points so that you can connect what's going on in Gnosticism and what is going on in 1 Timothy. Because if you do not know what about these things in Gnosticism, some of the things in 1 Timothy will not make a lot of sense or they'll be like well, why did he say that and things of that nature but I'm going to try to tie that together okay the first one is an emphasis on what we call eons they call gods I've put it in lowercase g the demiurge and the multiple mediators these are just aspects of eons each one being an eon uh, and if you remember we've talked about the word eon it shows up in both the Old Testament and New Testament as a translation of olam but that is not how they're defining it. Next, dualism. And that is about the flesh being unimportant. And the point that I want to bring out here, if you are being taught that the fact that you're in the flesh is a screw-up, that was an accident that should not have happened, and that the flesh is not important anymore, and so you can do anything you want with your flesh, it will not impact your spirit, that provides a lot of freedom. A lot of freedom. So, and, and passages which are not in your notes, but which you probably want to take note of is 1 Timothy 5, 6, and 15, and 2 Timothy 3, 6. I added them late because I realized that they are part of the discussion. That's 1 Timothy 5, 6, and verse 15, and 2 Timothy 3, 6. Now, I'm not going to cover them in this presentation, but they do tie into this. Okay, next is abstinence, and we've seen this. Uh, we saw this when we discussed in August of last year, 1 Timothy 4, uh, verse 3. It talked about restrictions of diet. Well, abstinence is part of that. Also, touch not, taste not, handle not, we saw as a pre-Gnostic movement in Colossae. You'll find that in Colossians 2, around verse 20. Voluntary humility. This is one where, and you've heard me say it many times, that I'm exceedingly humble. That's called voluntary humility in which I volunteer to you just how humble I am. <laughs> oh, okay. Worshiping of angels also occurs in Colossians 2.18. This was another aspect. Over-realized eschatology. What is over-realized eschatology? This is where you take some of the writings of Paul in early 1 Corinthians and take them too far. And one of the things that that leads to is 1 Timothy 4.3, which is the forbidding of marriage. And so you would think, well, why does an over-realized eschatology relate to forbidding marriage? And the answer is Matthew 22.30. This is the answer. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. If you take that as a literal straight, and if you teach other people, look at this. Their teaching will spread like gangrene, of whom is Hymenaeus, who concerning the truth has erred, saying that the resurrection is already passed. If the false teachers are teaching that the resurrection has already passed, then nobody's given in marriage, so it's logically to be deduced, you can't get married. Because we're already past that. And the master said there's no marriage. So this is an example of that problem. Uh, I underline gangrene because gangrene in the Greek is gangrene. It only occurs once in the whole Bible, okay, and I'm going to read the definition. A disease by which any part of the body suffering from inflammation becomes so corrupted that unless a remedy be applied soon, the evil continually spreads attacks other parts and at last eats away the bones. Now take that into a spiritual sense. If you have a teaching that's like gangrene, you better get some remedy. So that's why I just wanted you to know that gangrene is gangrene. Myths that are opposite of historical fact is another very popular Gnostic thing. And I'm going to, there's many myths. I'm only going to cover one because there's only one covered in First Timothy that I'm aware of specifically that's a myth and this is the one Eve preceded Adam gave him life and was not deceived but wisely ate the fruit that imparted knowledge yes and here's where that's from the Gnostic religion the message of the alien God and the beginning of Christianity this is where they break down all of Gnosticism that took place in the first century fascinating read 
Continuing, roles of Satan. Satan has more than one role. And when we get to the text, I'm going to point that out. And we're going to talk about the roles of Satan. The good roles of Satan. Very good roles. So let's move to Acts 18. After Paul, and Paul after this tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, sailed into Syria with him, Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head, for he had a vow. All right, let's take a look at the Greek. Notice that Priscilla comes first, then you have K-A-I, which is the Greek word for Anne, and then you have Aquila second. And that's the Greek text. That's the order of the Greek text. Let's continue. Verse 19, he came to Ephesus and left them there. He left Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus. But he himself entered into the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews. After that was over, he bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh to Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. He sailed from Ephesus. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, spoke and taught knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard him. Notice the order has now changed. Aquila is now first. But what does the Greek say? Oh, gosh, Priscilla is still first. Oh, well, isn't that interesting? Okay. I put 18 up just to remind you how it appeared in the previous text. Moving to 19, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came back to Ephesus. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the multitude, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, took away the disciples from the synagogue and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. The lecture hall of Tyrannus it was a place like this library in which you can either rent it or use it based on who you know. It was owned by a doctor. Uh, they have excavated it. And what I read about it was a, you could get together and make some type of arrangement and then go and use the hall for teaching. It's kind of what we do here. We make an arrangement with the library, who, by the way, just as a note, this year decided that they would change their uh, reading classes during the summer so that it didn't conflict with our services. That's a blessing. Yeah. Ten, and this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word. Two years, pretty good. Okay, the 13 through 17 of the seven sons, we know this story. 18, and many that believed came, confessed, and showed their deeds. 19, many of them also, which practiced the magical arts, brought their scrolls together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. One place that I read, studying the history, was that a day's wage was a piece of silver. That means that 200 people sacrificed a year's wages to burn this stuff. Pretty cool. I like that. That's a lot of stuff. Probably a big fire. 23, at the same time there arose no small stir about the way. Where are we? We are Ephesus. A certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we've made our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. And as it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. What happened? They got together and said, this is wrong what Paul is doing. So they had a riot. And they dragged some of the people into one of the places and started beating on them. And Paul was going in there. And then the disciples pulled him, kept him from going in there. And then one of the town's people from the government came in. And he set up 
He said, listen, I'm calling you people to order because what you're doing is illegal. And if the Romans come down here and call us on the carpet, we are going to be in trouble because we can give no account for the legality of your actions. And this was them per protesting that Paul was teaching people that idols are not really gods. This is a legal argument that the guy is giving. And what I like about it is, is that this is telling you how civilized Ephesus was. You've got some hotheads and you've got some government people who are standing up for the law to protect the way. Pretty good. Let's move on. From Melias he sent to Ephesus and he called the presbyters or the elders of the ecclesia. So what have we got? We have established leadership in Ephesus that Paul now calls. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, this is his message going away, and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you episcopus, bishops, overseers. Notice that Paul's position is when you take a position of authority, the Holy Spirit is the one who is really setting you in. This is not a man thing. I thought that was good. And to feed the ecclesia of God. For I know this. This is warning number one. After my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Warning number two. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking about things in a twisted and distorted manner to draw away disciples after them. So you got to do a warning here. You've got people will enter in after I leave. That's Paul speaking. And you're going to have people in leadership that the Holy Spirit has set into place who are going to arise against the truth. Well, that's a serious thing. You know, if man puts man in, then it's man. But if the Spirit puts man in and the man rebels, now that's serious. And I don't want to say it's not too serious, but it's not too serious. But it's still serious. And that's the role of Satan. And I'll bring that out here in a moment. What happened at Ephesus? This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Don't you think it's odd that we have an assembly established? Paul has been there like forever a couple of times. We've got leadership who have been appointed by the Holy Spirit set into place and Paul has to write from here on out do not lead a life that lines up with what Gentiles are leading. Wow. I'd be concerned about that. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither obscenity, nor foolish talking, nor gross indecency, which are all not proper, but rather the giving of thanks. These are some of the things that were taking place in Ephesus. That's really not good, I think. I think that's not good. All right, potential result. For this you know, for sure. No whoremonger, unclean person, covetous, one who's an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom. Six, let no one deceive you with words devoid of truth. Devoid of truth. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience and number seven for us be not therefore partakers with them I right, so you see what we've got going on we've got a very civilized city with laws but with idol worship with Paul preaching with a lot of people receiving with a well-established assembly with Leaders who are Jewish, Aquila and Priscilla, and look at the shape it is in. This is the story of Ephesus. Let's go to 1 Timothy. I cover most of the verses. The verses I don't cover are not majorly significant to what I'm trying to do here. And all of the translations are directly from the Greek by me, so, you know, unless otherwise, noted. 
As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay in Ephesus, talking to Timothy. Personal letter to Timothy, so that you might charge some to stop teaching false doctrines. This is verse 3 of chapter 1. I'd say he's getting right on the story. Okay? You need to charge some people to stop teaching false doctrines. Neither give heed to what? Myths that are opposite of historical fact. Endless genealogies describing the Gnostic emphasis on eons and the demiurge, which promote aimless arguing rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. What do we have happening here? We have people who are teaching falsely, myths, Gnostic eons, a completely different way that the world was created and managed, which gets people arguing back and forth, and the furthering of the administration of the kingdom of the Most High does not go forward. Problem. 1.5. Now the telos of the Torah is... Where do we see telos before? Romans 10, 4. The telos, Christ is the telos of the law. Say what the text says. Read the Greek letters with me. A, G, A, P, E. What does that spell? Agape. Out of a pure heart and a morally good conscience from a genuinely faithful following of the truth. That's what the goal of Torah is. That's pretty cool. I like that. Six, from which some having missed the mark. Now, you might be thinking, you see the asterisk? You might be thinking, oh, he put missed the mark in because he knows that in Hebrew, when talking about the Torah and you don't do something correctly, that a person missed the mark. No, this came from a Christian theologian, A.T. Robinson, in word pictures. He's a Greek grammar specialist. He listed that the Greek word meant having missed the mark. Having turned aside unto meaningless discussions. What did we discuss within the Gnostic hierarchy, let's say? Are these discussion about all these different gods and the different roles they take and the illicit relationships they have and how this interfaces with the mediation of man and blah, blah, blah. Come. That's how I would sum it up. Verse 7. Desiring to be teachers of Torah. I want you to notice that there's no condemnation by Paul here about people wanting to be teachers of Torah. This is after 60 AD. This is 30 years after the resurrection. These people desire to be teachers of Torah. But what does he say? What is the complaint? Is the complaint that, and that is the worst thing you could possibly do? No. He says, but they are not understanding what they're saying. So maybe they were new. They're, maybe they're new believers. And they're excited. And they are just running over at the mouth in excitement about what they've come into. But maybe they're not grounded yet. Or maybe they came into the assembly in the Torah portion was past Genesis and they were into Exodus. And so they did not know about Genesis. So they, nobody owns a Bible here. Don't think people got Bibles. There's no Bibles. It's what you get in the house church on Sabbath. That's all you get. So they desire to be teachers of Torah, but they're not understanding what they say, nor what they so confidently assert. People who are new, they're like, oh, yes, I'm telling you, that's what it means. you got to believe me. I've done that. <laughs> Early on, I've tried to slow it down a tad at this point, but that's how I was early on. One and eight. But we know that the law is good. This is Paul talking. If one uses it correctly as it was intended to be used. Wow, another positive affirmation of Torah. Nine. Knowing this, we're going to actually get a, an example of how to use Torah. This is just one example. Okay, The law is not made for one who is righteous. Okay, That right there tells us what role of the Torah he is talking about. And you remember, a couple of presentations ago, we covered all of those roles. 
So here he is. In the first opening part of the sentence, he tells us exactly what role he's speaking of. But for the lawless and disobedient, ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane. You know, when I, when I saw unholy and profane, I was thinking about the Ezekiel temple uh, and the priests who are going to be teaching what is holy and what's profane. For murderers, for one who has relations with a prostitute. That's what the Greek word meant. I looked it up. For homosexuals, for kidnappers, liars, perjurers. Okay, look at this summation that Paul puts and any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine. Where did he just get all these doctrines from? Torah. So now, but he rec recognizes that he cannot list all of the commandments. So he gives a good, you know, like short list. And then he says, if there's any other thing that's contrary to Torah, that's who Torah's for. I thought it was good. Number 11. This is Paul. He's, gonna, he's going to share something with Timothy that can be shared with the people later. According to the gospel, and I thank Yeshua our Lord who has enabled me and counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. What we have here is like a little mini testimony. Who was before? A blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. That's Paul. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Meditate on that for a moment. I believe he refers to himself as the Jew of Jews raised in the traditions, raised in the Torah, circumcised on the eighth day, and there's probably a few other things in there that he's got too, but he pursued the way ignorantly in unbelief. Pretty good, pretty good. And we'll, that's going to come back around and help us when we get back to Satan's roles in helping the believers in the ecclesia. Moving to 18, I'm skipping over the rest of his testimony. This charge I commit unto thee, my son Timothy. Hold on to the true faith with a clear conscience, which some, here's our hint, have pushed aside, having failed to continue to live with a clear conscience and have become spiritually ruined. This is at Ephesus. And concerning the clear conscience, I put some scriptures here so you'd have access to the three times that Paul talks about his clear conscience. Of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered to Satan. Roles of Satan. Let's talk about one. Why did he deliver him to Satan? So that he could learn not to insult God. That's interesting. That's a role of Satan. To teach believers who have strayed off the path not to insult God. Yeah. First consideration. Let's do another role of Satan. 1 Corinthians 5.5 5, To deliver such a one unto Satan for what? The destruction of the flesh. So, here's how I understand it. You can deal with your own flesh. But you don't have to. You can just proceed along until it's time for Satan to step in and destroy your flesh for you. So it's the easy way or the hard way. You know, it's up to you. It's, you know, what a great deal. Why do we get the destruction of the flesh? That the spirit might be saved when the day of Yahweh arrives. So we have people set into authority over the assembly with the blessing of the Holy Spirit who have gone astray from the truth, have become spiritually ruined, are leading people to believe things that are not true, who Timothy was charged by Paul to shut their mouths. What's happening here? Satan seems to be working for us. Something to think about. I want to bring this up because... You need to see our relationship to these people. And I had to go outside of Timothy to do it. 2 Thessalonians 3.14, If anyone obey not our word by this epistle, 
Those two guys I just mentioned would fall into that class. It says, tell them, here's your sign. Can you imagine a sign? It says, I do not obey. <laughs> it means to take special note of these people. And do not mingle together with them that they may become... Let's take a look at this Greek word. Spell this Greek word with me. E-N. That's E-N. T-R-A-P-E. Entrapped. The Greek word is entrapped. Do not mingle together with them that they may become entrapped so as to turn back. Kind of brings up a memory of Psalm 19.7. The Torah is perfect and is that which allows a person to turn back. It entraps them with the role of Satan. I like this. Okay, so now every time I see a bush, I need to check and see if he's there. Yet count them not as an enemy. These are the people who are wearing these new signs. Do not count them as an enemy, but instruct them as though they were a fellow believer. That's a high calling. Slightly challenging, I would say. All right, let's review 1 Timothy 1. Chapter 1 begins with what outlines the central and overriding concern. The havoc wrought by false teaching. Pretty easy stuff here. Paul's goal is to guide Timothy in ways to help him stop the false teaching menace in the assembly at Ephesus. Paul lists key aspects of the false teaching taking place in the assembly and his solution regarding the prime culprits. That was verse 20. Here's a review of a couple of those passages. I, Paul, write unto you, Timothy, stay in Ephesus and charge some to stop teaching false doctrine. I was once just like them a blasphemer, persecutor, and a violent aggressor. But I obtained mercy, and they can too, if they repent. Bring them alongside as a brother. Wow. I, Paul, charge you, Timothy, hold on to the true faith with a clear conscience, which some, having pushed aside, have failed to continue to live with and have become spiritually ruined of whom is Hominius and Alexander, who I delivered to Satan so that they can learn not to insult God. Okay, you see where we are here? We see the role of Satan. I have another passage coming up with Hominius shortly here to show you where things are, but I want you to get a hold of how Satan works with us to help us during this time of probation. That's exciting. I'm moving into 1 Timothy 2. Verse 1, A. Therefore is Paul's Greek word for logical connection between what has just been said and what's about to be said. In this particular case, it's between the false teachers and what shall follow. I do skip around, so pay close attention. 1, C. Therefore to all people including, 2, A. Kings and those in authority, 1, B. Do these four things. Let supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all. Another very challenging thing for believers today in America. Verse 2. Why do we want to do those four things? So that we may lead life, lead a quiet and peaceable life. in all godliness and honesty. This is good in the sight of God. Who wants all of mankind to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? Okay, I'm breaking this up into parts. First, the word wants. This is an action verb. If you remember the action verb in Matthew 5.17, I came to fulfill still the same thing, active voice, present tense verb. All of mankind, 
reaching out to all of mankind, and come to a knowledge of the truth. He would desire that everyone come to a knowledge of the truth. And he's going to cause the saints to do everything within their ability, and I mean their ability, their change into his image ability, to bring alongside those who have strayed, treating them like a brother, to bring them back into the truth prior to having to call on plan B, Satan. Okay, let's begin with a theological refutation of the false teachings. Once again, Paul's going to pick up. You remember I went through uh, a slight, like listing, a small listing of Gnostic. Here we go. Gnosticism says there are many gods or eons. Paul says, for there is one God. Gnosticism says, then there's the demiurge, the half-creator, who should have never come into existence because that was with illicit relations on a spiritual plane, and the multiple mediator eons to save humanity from this half-creator. Paul says, there's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Messiah Yeshua. So here he is, one sentence, two points, refuting Gnosticism. Continuing. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified to at the appropriate times. In other words, one testimony of him as mediator has already taken place. There's another one to take place in the future. Times was in the plural. Seven. Whereunto I am ordained a herald and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I see this here, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, what is the possibility that these uh, false teachers were telling lies about Paul to the people? Well, you know, possible. Don't know, but possible. So now we're going to get into the text. 2.8a, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. B, lifting up holy hands can only be done if the life is pure. C, without anger or wrath and disputing, which if you go back to verse 4, chapter 1, is a change from the aimless arguing. So what we have here is in this positive affirmation is a rebuking of what's going on in Ephesus. They can't pray. They can't lift up their holy hands because they're constantly disputing about stuff that's garbage. So here he's, he's laying out, this is, what I, Timothy, this is what I want, Timothy. This is what I want you to do. 2.9a, women, similarly, when praying, should adorn themselves in modest apparel, should adorn themselves with respect and self-control, should not wear braided hair with gold ornaments, I'll speak on that in a second, or pearls, or very expensive clothing. Today, pearls can come in different forms, including real. Back then, real was it. You had pearls, you had money. Expensive clothing, you had money. Braided hair with gold in it, you had money. He wants people to adorn themselves in modest apparel, not describing their checkbook. Okay? Ten, but should adorn themselves with good deeds. Appropriate for women who profess vocally that they are godly. I put vocally in because of the Greek word that's there. The Greek word identifies women or people, but in this case women, engaged in the vocal profession of describing how godly they are, which to me is a big hint. When somebody has to come and tell me, let me tell you about how godly I've been recently, that's the first flag. They go, okay, go ahead. <laughs> they start to the talking, and then the next flag comes up. If you are a professional professor, then, uh, you know, I hope you've got the goods. And that's what this word is talking about here. If you're going to profess vocally to people that you are godly, then you should be adorned with good works. Here is Bdag. To claim to be well accomplished in something, to give oneself out as an expert in something. 
Well, I'm an expert in humbleness and godliness. Let me tell you about it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> First flag. First Timothy 6.21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith, and 2 Timothy 3.5, having a form of godliness. Okay, so now putting all these pieces together, I have a quote I want to read. Since professing falsely called knowledge. Remember, Gnosticism is the Greek word Gnostic, which is the word for knowledge. Pro falsely called knowledge in 621 is an activity of the false teachers. And since the false teachers were professing godliness, this expression in 1 Timothy 2.10 is particularly appropriate if Paul wrote this with women in mind who were professing godliness in accordance with false teachings. It fits. Fits the facts. Let's go to 2.11. A. Let a woman learn. What is God's perspective? He wants all of mankind to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's very important. His perspective about women is he wants them to be able to learn. But what is the cultural perspective of first century Ephesus? This command contrasts with the absence of women from any list of students in Ephesian schools at that time. Women were not taught. That's amazing. Men were taught, women were not taught. So the perspective is the Almighty wants women to come to a knowledge of the truth. In Ephesus, they don't want women to know anything. Pretty good. All right, but there's one more perspective we have to know. Because if I don't tell you, you'll ask about it. Oh, by the way, this particular quote is from Women in the Church, an analysis and application of 1 Timothy. Okay, here is the rabbinic perspective concerning let a woman learn. It is, rather should the words of the Torah be burned than entrusted to a woman. That's very uplifting in a manly type sense. <laughs> Whoever teaches his daughter the Torah is like one who teaches her lasciviousness. Wow. Yeah, they have a lot of light. To come to a knowledge of the truth, which requires teaching, also requires the opportunity to learn and the proper setting. KJV in B says, in silence. The meaning does not mean silence. That's important. This discussion comes from Eve's Deception, Dr. Harris, Wives and Women's Ministry by Dr. Bartlett, and Wealthy Women at Ephesus, 1 Timothy in Social Context by Dr. Paget. They discuss about these things in Ephesus and this Greek word. The meaning in the context of this passage's consistent desire for peace without trouble, and I put the verses there so you can go back and refer to them, is not silence, but quietness, peace. It's a completely different, different word for silence. And this is not it. But that's how it's been translated. But quietness, peace, well, that's silence, but, you know, they're different. That's why Paul used a different Greek word. And it's the opposite of discord and disruption. And you see that in some of the things we talked about with Gnosticism taking place in Ephesus. Here's another quote. This word indicates a manner of learning. This is a cultural thing. A manner of learning that was culturally regarded as being the appropriate behavior of a well-bred, serious student. That's very good. This is what he's saying that women should learn. They should be at this place. Paul here commands that women be permitted to learn as proper students with a quiet and teachable spirit. Very good. Comes from man and woman, Dr. Payne. Continuing, let a woman learn in quietness, peaceably, with all subjection. All right, got to stop on the word subjection because some people have interpreted it a certain way. Up to this point, not a single word has been mentioned about what? Marriage. 
And there's nothing else in the whole chapter about marriage. So unless he tells me that this is about marriage, it's probably not about marriage. Just saying. Let's continue. The Greek word that's used here, it modifies to learn. Now think about that. Let a woman learn in quietness, peaceably, submitting to all the truths they are learning. Who are we talking about? The false teachers, in this case specifically the ladies. That's who he's talking to Timothy about. And he's saying, I want them to learn because they desire to be teachers of Torah, but they do not know what they are talking about yet. So let's let them learn. Parallels to consider. Learning truth versus being deceived, which might be learning falsehood. I probably could have put learning falsehood. Okay? Also, submitting to the truth is the opposite of falling into transgression. Walking according to how you're supposed to walk versus walking according to violation of how you're supposed to walk. A couple of parallels that we can consider. So that ends verse 11. We come to verse uh, 12, which really doesn't add anything to this discussion. And so we're just going to skip over verse 12 and move forward. Okay, so we're going to stop and take a break now. And we'll come back and pick it up here in a few minutes.